my own, I've had many different experiences with gift economy, uh, but the one that is most relevant for this discussion was the one that was, I would define it as a failure. <laughs> and uh, the one that was related to my own economic situation, my own livelihood, my own survival, trying to uh, make this work uh, in a way that I could offer my gifts to the world, to society, without having to charge money, without having to turn it into a commodity to really offer this as a gift and um, to receive uh, whatever I need to sustain myself and my project uh, as a gift in return. Um, so I co-founded an organization, an association called Mycosomatic Magic, which is a nonprofit association offering psychedelic therapy, psilocybin therapy to people in need. Um, we have facilitators based in Spain and we work more or less on the, the standard Western clinical model uh, pioneered by the likes of Johns Hopkins. So it's a one-on-one -on -one session with people uh, and it goes on for all day. So it's about eight hours. It's very intensive emotionally um, for us as facilitators and we put a lot of care and thought into making this as beneficial as possible for uh, the people that we work with. And I initially, uh, I was offering these sessions um, on a donation basis. And what happened was that some people uh, were responding um, with generosity and others not. And eventually it got to a point where the ones who were not, it really started, you know, each time it happened, um, it wasn't even so much the, this kind of pressure that I had to make enough income to survive uh, as much as this kind of feeling of uh, the need for appreciation that I was not um, finding myself being fulfilled in offering this, um, putting so much in and then, you know, quite consistently getting this kind of response where it, it just seems like, you know, yeah, it's not really being valued. And so I retreated from from offering these uh, sessions on a donation basis and I actually started charging a fee. Um, and I was never happy about that, uh, but I did feel happier than when I was doing it by donation basis and I wasn't getting donations. So um, it, it seems like the, the lesser of two evils in a way and and so in convening the panel, I, I was looking for people who managed, it seemed, um, to transcend this kind of mentality of choosing the lesser of two evils, because I think that a lot of people who have this genuine desire to, to give their gifts freely, um, we, we are prevented from doing that from this fear of what if we do this and then you know, it doesn't work out. And so the choice of security is to to just go with the, the safer option, with the option that is presented by the society as, you know, the rational one and the one that's more practical. But that also is unfulfilling. And um, in many ways, it's it's exclusionary, of course. Uh, you're not allowing people who might not be able to pay the fee uh, or buy the thing that you're offering. And so let me just pass it through to um, Kazu. Would you like to begin? Sure. Thank you all so much. 
Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you may be dialing from. Uh, good to be here with you all. My name is Kazu Haga. I'm, uh, I usually live in Oakland, California, which is uh, sort of Nolajan Ohlone land, um, but I'm currently in New Jersey, which I think is Lenape land. I'm actually not sure. I just got here like an hour ago. Um, yeah, I, um, what to say? I, well, I'll, I'll start by sharing that for the last 10 years or so, I left the organization I used to work with last year, but for 10 years, I ran a nonprofit organization that ran on the gift economy. And we were able to run our programs for 10 years, about 10,000 people coming through our programs and never charged anybody a single penny. Um, and over the 10 years, we developed these eight principles of the gift economy and a bunch of practices. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll have time to go through all of the principles, uh, but I think I'd rather just do some storytelling and, and, and uh, you know, see what emerges from there. I was introduced to social change work when I was 17 years old, when I met a group of Japanese Buddhist monastics from a Japanese Buddhist order called Nikonza Myohoji. And they didn't talk about the gift economy. They didn't have that language, but these monastics are, um, their faith uh, tells them that they're not allowed to fundraise. They, they don't ask for money. And somehow they're able to have and maintain monasteries all over the world. And the way they oftentimes open a new monastery is that a monastic, a monk or nun, will go to a new city and they will walk around the city drumming and chanting and praying all day until somebody offers them food. They will sleep in the street until someone offers them housing. And in this way, they build these relationships. And at some point, someone donates a piece of land to them and builds a temple. And this is how they built monasteries all over the world. And so, you know, while I didn't have the, the language of the gift economy, I was really inspired at a young age that, to, to feel like it's, it's actually possible to build the work that we want to do without this like traditional fundraising strategies. And then when, uh, 2012, I believe, when the Occupy Wall Street movement happened. I was really involved in um, Oakland, California at Occupy Oakland. And at the time I was doing nonviolence trainings and this wave of interest in nonviolence training just exploded at Occupy Oakland. And we were doing two day workshops on nonviolence every single weekend for like 50 people. And at the time, there was a, an organization called the East Bay Meditation Center. They're still around. They're known as one of the most diverse meditation centers in the entire world. And they were hosting all of our workshops for free. And this was a, a meditation center that, was, that operated on the gift economy. And so because we were hosting all of our workshops there, the one thing that they asked for was that we host all of our workshops on the gift economy. So that was actually the first time I heard this language of the gift economy. And I didn't know much about it at the time, but they were, you know, essentially saying we want to make sure that this training is accessible to everybody, regardless of their ability to pay. And I was like, of course, that's awesome. And at the time, I thought it was just um, kind of like a, oh, just pay what you can to make things accessible to everybody. And that was the extent of my understanding. And in the, you know, 12 or 13 years since then that I've been deep in this experiment, I realized that the gift economy is so much more than that. It's so much more than just an economic system. It's so much more than telling people, oh, just give us what you can. Um, someone once said that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And I find that to be true. Like I can imagine 15 different ways that the world might end, but to imagine a world after capitalism, is actually really difficult for us because as much as we may dislike it, it's all most of us have ever known. So how does economic work outside of this market system? And while the gift economy, there isn't one right way to do the gift economy, it's not a perfect system. To me, it's one of the closest bridges that I've experienced that gets us from the world that we live in now to the world that we want to build. And so I just wanna uh, share some, some more stories. You know, I, I've I think in the, the gift economy, the essence of it is trying to build a way that we manage resources that is modeled after natural ecosystems. Like nature has a, a, a natural organic way to balance resources, to make sure resources get from where they are to where they're going in a way that is sustainable, in a way that is equitable, 
in a way that creates thriving for all living organisms in the ecosystem. And I think it's, it's, it's as simple as like trying to, as human beings, remember what it's like to manage resources in this way, right? And so one of the, the um, principles that, that we practice in the gift economy is generosity. And generosity, like pure generosity, is when you completely divorce the giving and the receiving, right? When you give like genuinely out of the desire to give. I believe it was Gandhi who said that the scent of the, the scent of a rose stays with the giver. Like when you give someone a rose, the beautiful smell of the rose actually stays with you. And you know, if you go up in a space, there is no up or down or left or right. And similarly, I think when we really live into the gift, the binary of giver and receiver just dissipates and you just become part of this ecosystem where resources are flowing. I do a lot of work with incarcerated communities in California. I work a lot in the prison system. And years ago, I went to Soledad State Prison, which is a prison I've been working at for about 10 years. And when I walked in, the men that I work with handed me a check for almost $2,000. These men make as much as $2 US a day for their labor. And they spent months going cell to cell throughout the entire prison collecting money. And when they gave me that check, they said, we wanna make sure that people on the outside have access to your teachings, just like you've been bringing them to us. Like incarcerated people who make $2 a day were thinking about people outside of prison and wanting to make sure that the programs that we were running were accessible to people that they would never meet, to people who make way more than them. And that is an act of radical generosity. Like they genuinely wanted to support people they will never know. I've also, you know, I've, I've, I've actually very happily recently left the kind of like nonprofit industry. I've, I've been in nonprofits my entire adult life. And one of the many reasons why I've been disillusioned by nonprofits is because even within like very progressive social justice nonprofit organizations, there's this constant growth mentality. Let's just raise as much money as we can because we'll figure out something good to do with it. And that is just not sustainable, right? There is no tree in an ecosystem that says, well, I'm just going to suck up as much water from the ground as possible because I'll figure out something good to do with it. That's not how natural ecosystems work. My partner and I, we oftentimes have these conversations rather than thinking like, how can we earn more money? Like what's our strategy for like building up our finances? We have conversations about what is the least amount of financial resources that we need to thrive. And as we think about that, it forces us to think about what are the non-monetary resources that we need that can help us thrive, right? I realized that, especially in a lot of nonprofits, but in, in personal life too, like the more money you have, the more you get used to thinking about resources just as financial resources and you forget the importance of community and relationship and access to land as important resources. And so part of the gift economy is, is like real deep intention and discernment about the question of what is enough. What are resources? What kind of relationships do we want to have with those resources? And, you know, the last story that I'll, I'll share before um, I pause and, you know, be lots of time for more conversations is this idea of, um, like, in a market system, we all pay the same price, right? Many of you have seen the, the meme of, like, the difference between equality and equity. That equality is, like, we all pay the same amount, we all get the same amount, but because of systems of injustice, hundreds and thousands of years of, of um, economic injustice, we don't start from the same place. And so it's really important that we don't create a system that is like fair, where everyone pays the same price to access the same resources. Uh, years ago, I did a four hour workshop and a very wealthy person, I didn't know she was wealthy, happened to be in the workshop. And for the four hour workshop, she gave me $20,000. And that's the beauty of the gift economy is we don't set like an upper limit or a lower limit. So it creates space for people to actually be generous. Years later, I facilitated a two-day workshop in a county jail, and a young incarcerated man approached me at the end of the workshop. And he said, when I was arrested, I had $100 of cash in my pocket. 
I want to sign over this waiver so you can go downtown and get that money out of my pocket because I want to support the work that you're doing. And I guess the, the, the question I want to ask is like, what's more valuable? $20,000 from someone who has millions of dollars in wealth or $100 from a young incarcerated man sitting in a jail cell in a county jail? From a market system, of course, $20,000 is way more valuable. But I think the gift economy allows us to really honor people's stories, right? Not their bank accounts, but their stories and their genuine desire to give. We used to have this donor who every time we sent out fundraising appeals to the organization that I used to work with, every single time she would write us a check for $2 because it's what she could afford. It was only $2, but every single time she sent us that check. And I will, oh, like, I don't remember most donors' names, but I will always remember her because of her passion to give. Whereas, you know, another time we had um, a foundation that gave us a $100,000 unrestricted grant. And we wrote this blog piece when we received the grant that was like, we just received this $100,000 grant. We're so grateful to the foundation. And we are, because there are people in the foundation that really trusted in our work. But then I got some feedback from a mentor of mine who really taught me a lot about the gift economy. And he said, you know, you would never write a blog piece thanking a donor who sent $10. So why are you thanking someone who gave you $100,000 as if that's automatically worth more? And I really grapple with that because... I'm still conditioned in this way where if someone gives me a thousand dollars, it's like, oh my God, that's a thousand dollars. That's amazing. And I really have to question my own conditioning about why that feels so much more valuable to me than someone who can afford to give me $10. And for them, that's a stretch. And so I think living in the gift economy just requires me to ask all of these questions about the ways that I've been conditioned to look at what's valuable what's relational, what's considered a resource. And so, yeah, again, it's so much more than just a way to offer my work at a like pay what you can system. It's about what can we learn from natural ecosystems about how to create sustainability and what do I need to do to be back in right relationship with our, with all of the resources that surround me. And so, yeah, grateful to be here to share some of these stories and look forward to sharing more. So I'll, I'll uh, pause there for now. Thank you so much, Kazum. That was wonderful, wonderful. I was wondering, uh, you mentioned when we spoke before that uh, you had some images that you were gonna share. Do you, do you have those available? Do you still wanna do that? I think slides are kind of, I've been doing slides a lot lately, so I thought I'd just go with stories and see what emerged. Okay, cool. cool. So, uh, Camilo, would you like to continue? Take the baton. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, first, very thankful to for the invitation that gave me a a perspective of uh, of myself, no, like uh, also also try to 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 understand some some moments of my life because maybe um I I I when I arrived to university some five years ago maybe it was the first time that I heard the about gift economy as a concept. Uh, I think in so many ways in Ecoversities Alliance and uh, people outside the, the, the Ecoverse, but that are part of the Alliance, um, practice so many ways of um, giving, no? And receiving and being and, you know, understanding what, what's more than, than money, but also trying to, to, to make it the best as possible of abundance and joy through the, through the exchange. So um, I understood that I, I had practiced also very lucky to, before yeah, that I, I've got lots of practice and I've heard and I've seen lots of uh, economies that are not, um, and that are a gift, that are that based on that, um, principle of 
um, exchanging the best energy you can. You know, that's maybe yesterday there was another session criticizing okay, money. And they were really emphasizing on the division between what's economy and what's money. Money is one of the strategies for the economy, but economies. And I remembered also some years ago, I learned in, I was living in Ecuador and there was a, a network of uh, uh, autonomous currencies, more than 50 all over the country. And I've been, uh, I was invited to uh, one of their gatherings and it was in, in, incredible, but they would call, they were, call, they called their economy or their um, strategy, the e eco si nuestra in Spanish, economia. It's like, to say like my economy, like, mm, you know, just changing a word, eco si nuestra, they are changing uh, the negative to positive and uh, nuestra means uh, for us, like uh, from us, you know, so uh, just the name. That's what the, that was the name of the network. I remember it made me understand um, the possibility that I after in, in those maybe in these last 10 years, I had I had in so many ways to practice it. And I would like to maybe talk about those experiences where I was invited to practice and that in the presentation you were like saying something silly about like successfully in the gift we are that we are experiences of successful gift economy but um and and that's the perspective that I'm like yeah they work they did work and it still work so it's yeah like successful experiences that I might share um when I was in Ecuador and I and I was invited to this uh, network of uh, autonomous currencies, I was living in a little town and being part of a, an autonomous school for children and I was the uh, the companion, the guide of the smaller group. But as adults, we were all together in this project. There was not like boss or something like that. There was like, parents and the people that we were companions all together in a circle always talking but uh the economy part, part was always a problem because we were not talking about that we were talking very intensely about alternative ways new ways uh, our ancient ways also but to educate but not the parents education and life like what what was supporting that so it was very nice when um, some, well, it's it's like a mentor. He's, he was one of the most important um, people in Ecuador that started a community of education of a free, of a free, for a free school a long time ago. He was like doing a tour and he arrived to our school in our little town and we were like, yay, we want to meet him. And he arrived directly with this that uh, the understanding that uh, uh, every single community needs to talk about their health and economy is our health. And that uh, if we were not, uh, we if we wanted to talk about education, we needed also to support our, uh, our ways of living, our food, whatever it means to be outside that, that project of a school that also as a community, um, gives like we have to give help to, to our our communities uh, the economy the, the capitalist economy is getting us very sick in all many ways so uh he brought us something that is called mutu apoyo uh, a dynamic and a strategy that uh, uh, after the local currencies and autonomous currencies that's that's the other maybe experience that i've had the mutuo apoyo, it's a very basic, basic way of saying, come together again as a as little clans or maybe um, circles of um, support is, is traduced, you know, where we are going to bring back our energy, in this case, the money, the money, but the best energy we can, we can bring together into this circle includes money but includes also time and includes also um yeah like open open heart open 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 ears to listen to us and understand the life together 
in that way also and in these networks we are very friend we have lots of friends from communities ancestral communities that already practice some things like that where concepts like Aini for example in the from the people from the Andes it's it's more than how the economy goes or how to exchange or make a, an exchange no it's more than that it's like every single moment in your life whatever action you are doing it's part of of of, of of it, you know, it's part of the whole exchange. So even how you breathe, how you wake up. So uh, whenever you are doing something, you are exchanging with nature and with life and with Mother Earth. So to give that the best energy, you can always, to always give it. So you can always receive the best energy, the best food, the best uh, family, the best, you know, like the best relations, that case. So we were very nurtured by that. And um, we did have, well, it's something like, it starts to be like, a, also like a autonomous bank, something like that. We start like uh, bringing every single month, every single uh, time we, we meet once, once a month, some treasure to put inside. Sometimes it's money, but it could be also lots, lots of more. And like to make like a big pot, that it will be shared every single time we also meet because every single thing that goes into the into the center goes out. As a basic exercise for communities, I've been sharing this and then uh, practicing and also participating in some of them when I'm invited. So right now I'm, I have like at least three groups of the, like that. I know three times a month, I have a group of people that will bring like lots of things to the center and then we will have lots of abundance i can ask also and talk about this about like all the the sickness of the capitalism i can come and talk about that and uh i think it, it has been one of the best experiences because after that i can i can have other 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 um examples traveling for example it's in abundance opening to to go to the road and start a travel and also receiving people like networks like lots of uh, in your house and stuff but that had been very nur nur um, very together with this this that i'm telling you like uh, completing a way of life that might help me to say that maybe half of the energy i exchange it's in as a gift uh, yeah, something like that. Thank you, Camilo. Beautiful to hear that. And also... I have a yeah. link, but it's Go in ahead. Spanish. And it's a very rustic drive thing that I did, like in Excel. Or well, not in Excel, in Paint or something like that. <laughs> but it's, and it's in Spanish, but it's well explained. And maybe people can just take the things and translate them very and and they they talk about the like the system of mutual support circle it's very easy and it's in that in that case it's a transition system you know the the concept of transition there's a movement called transition but the tra like like it's it's an economy that it's not uh, all radical into not using money so the example it's in money is with how how to share money and to put it out the capitalist uh, system somehow. Can you just Yeah, please do share that. Yeah. Thank you, Camilo. Um, and I know that uh, both you and uh, Sierra work together on the uh, Ecoversities Alliance. Um, and you have experiences uh, with gift economy through this work that you're doing together. So um, maybe the two of you or, you know, one of you or both of you could uh, share a bit about those experiences. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, Great. Yeah, again, thank you so much, um, Sadiq, for, for this invitation um, to explore together. I really feel like it's one of the collective paths of learning that so many of us are on right now. It feels like a topic that is very alive. Um, some of us have been on this path for longer. Um, Kazu, it was incredible to hear your stories and 
um, that you've been doing this work for a very long time and asking these questions. And um, yeah, thank you for the storytelling. It's really powerful. Um, and honestly, like in terms of like the points, I don't know, like my direct experience um, exploring this, I feel like I've come to many of the same, yeah, I come across many of the same kind of lessons. Um, but yeah, um, I can speak from, ah, let's see where to start. What feels most natural is to start with actually the story of this conference that we're in, um, which is also related to um, this path um, that Camila and I are on, um, this exploration um, in the Ecoversities Alliance. I will say Camila has definitely been one of, um, I would say one of my teachers in, in the gift economy in exploring. Yes. <laughs> yes. You have brought so much to us. So many, so many tools and so many frameworks that have really supported this exploration. And by no means have we gotten to a place where it feels like, you know, if it, yeah, we're like in the middle of like, <laughs> what, what does this even mean? What does it mean? What does gift economy mean to us? Um, in preparing for this session, it occurs to me that I think we all live in the gift. Um, if you think about it, like everything that we have, everything uh, in terms of resources and 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 um, our lives are ultimately comes as a gift from the earth um, and from each other who are part of the earth. Um, and so um, I think, yeah, the title of learning to live fully in the gift is like, it's, it's less of like a doing and more of a, like a being and like, and like just being present to what, what already is. Um, and I think that is a key aspect of that. And, um, and also being in this, I think for me personally, I come from a very, like I grew up in Northern Canada and a very, like, I would say, yeah, very individualistic, very, um, uh, like a culture that is very like separated um, from nature and from natural flows and with a lot of like the fear and insecurities, I think that um, Jason, you mentioned when it came, when it comes to, um, yeah, money. And um, I remember one, one key moment in my path that really helped me kind of shift my thinking was reading this book called Sacred Economics by Charles Eisenstein and just the idea like just like actually thinking about the word economics and parsing that out like it has the word eco in it which means home and I guess nomics comes from like something to do with like management so like managing our home but like just the fact that eco is in that and like my previous like my connotation to the word economics was very much had nothing to do with like the natural world. Like I was thinking, you know, like people in buildings with computers and numbers and <laughs> like, yeah, um, a lot of like manipulation and control. And um, and so just even that, like the sacred and the idea of, 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 the, of, of something that could be regarded as sacred um, was a huge piece for me. Um, and so, yeah, fast forward to this experience with kind of diving into the Ecoversities world and um, really it being at this place of, um, you know, there's these, there's these like ideas that we come across and these like, yeah, um, sometimes not yeah, like like phrases and and terms that um, sound really good, like the gift economy. But what does that really mean in practice? And what does that mean in practice in relationship with other people in very different contexts? Um, and I think I've learned the most just ask like being in the question of that with Camilo and our friends in the Alliance. And the Alliance is an organization in in some ways. Um, but also not an organization in some ways because we're in this process of reimagining what that even means to be an organization. Um, and we emphasize the relational piece. I think that's what really grounds us. Um, and that's what's being really helpful too 
in this exploration of of how we manage money together um and I remember like so much has shifted and we've learned so much um since I started um in in the alliance which was like four years ago or five years ago now um I remember when we first had the idea for this conference um and somebody was like oh we should we should make it you know like sliding scale or like it doesn't really feel good to like charge for it like what if we what if we just like make it like by contribution um so that it's accessible to people who may not be able to pay um and I remember that distinctly there was like a number of people who were like that's not gonna work we've tried that we've tried that it doesn't work people don't pay it's gonna fail <laughs> so immediately there was already resistance and like I guess like um like fear there um and probably for good reason from people who had had those experiences um but we were like the next generation so we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna try it anyways and <laughs> we have new ideas and maybe it'll work and and yeah I, I feel a lot of pride <laughs> around just like how much abundance has come through and even even though I believed it would work um since the beginning it has far exceeded any of our expectations in terms of um the number of people who contribute both financially but more importantly the the flow of I think one of the pieces that was so important was opening to that piece of like non-monetary how do we how do we see value in that way um and and, and invite that kind of um contribution um so yeah then and and then just like the exponential abundance that have come with that like in terms of relationships and friendships and uh, people like uh, like people who like are like my favorite people and closest people in the world right now that I would not have this connection with if it wasn't for um, this invitation of getting involved in in different ways and and, and contributing in different ways uh, beyond the monetary. Um, and so, yeah, it's been really beautiful to see that, to open to that. Um, I think um, there's another, there's another, piece um that Camilo could speak to more but that I'm really grateful for um in terms of how we do this like like it's a specific tool <laughs> that I think has been really helpful called the um abundance pie we've been calling it so basically with the the money that comes through sponsorships and through registrations of the conference the way that that the way that we manage that together um as a as a team of people who um put the hours and hours and hours into making this conference a thing um, is this process called the abundance pie, which is we really, we literally get into a room together and we just have a conversation. Um, like It's like, this is the abundance pie that we have. Um, and we talk about not just like what we did and what we would like to receive um, like in retribution for our time or whatever, but we we share like our stories and our like feelings and our needs and our like, you know, like, do we need to pay rent for the next three months? Like who, who is feeling abundant, who needs, maybe needs more. And we also, it's, a, it's an opportunity to celebrate each other in a really beautiful way. Um, Cause sometimes people, you know, will be like, well, I think I could receive this much. And you're like, no, like you did so much work. Like you really should take more of the pie. Um, and to be able to like, be like I see I, I see what you're doing and I recognize and I appreciate you um, and then the money is just sort of like a layer that helps kind of facilitate that seeing of each other and, and really being in attention with each other's um, with each other's yeah like like energy and gifts um, and so yeah that process is something that Camilo gifted to us um, both in the rec space and also in ecoversities um, and it's something as like an ongoing learning process. Um, the, yeah. So I don't wanna say more. I think there's a piece around, um, yeah, just the shift from, um, I think you mentioned um, Kazu also, like the, the shift from the focus of making more or like the growth mindset um, to, in, in my personal case, like rather than like prioritizing, like a lot of my family does, like making more to prioritizing, like what does it look like to spend less and still feel abundant, right? Um, and what is, what is that, like, where am I at in that? And um, 
And I think as an organization also, it's it's so tempting to be like, oh, like gr more grant writing, more funding, more like we need more money. And I, and I feel like I'm, I often am like, wait, wait a minute, go like, what would we do with that more money and how, like with the money we already have, like, how is it feeling and how are people feeling cared for? Um, because having more money doesn't just automatically solve um, those, those like needs. Um, yeah, I feel like I've spoken plenty. <laughs> um, I, I think I'll leave it for there. Um, but yeah, maybe one last question is like, how can we be, how can each of us be um, a channel for for flow? Um, I think that to think about money kind of in terms of water and how water becomes unhealthy when it's stagnant, um, when it sits and doesn't flow. And when water, the water cycle is healthy is when everything is flowing. And I think money is, yeah, is, is it has that possibility too if we hold it in that way. Thank you so much, Sierra. Beautiful sharing. Uh, I want to call on um, Ethan, if you're there. I do see there's a number that's dialed in. Yep, that's me. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi Ethan. Ethan. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Good to hear from you. Good to see that you were able to make it. Yeah, thank you. Well, first, thanks so much to Sadiq and Peyton and everyone who organized this. And I just feel thankful to be sitting on a panel with Kazu, hi, an old friend, and Camilo. And hey, and, uh, hey. And just to let people know, I'm excited to be here. And I'm also dealing with a Lyme infection and a Epstein Barr infection. So my energy is lower. So just if I pause, <laughs> I'm just taking a breath because my body's tired and my brain, but my heart is overjoyed to hear everyone's stories. Mm. And I want to start with just um, my ancestors, especially on my mom's side. My grandmother and grandfather both grew up in small villages in Italy, in Poland. And they brought the spirit of hospitality in our, our family lineage. And they always, my grandma was always hosting people at the house. I'd come and someone who had a broken leg whose family couldn't take care of them would be there. Or someone else would be there that had been unemployed. And so I learned this, the gift beginning with hospitality. And that was carried on by my dad and mom who would host all kinds of people in our home, ranging from inner city kids my dad worked with you are outside of Boston to um, kids with Down syndrome, and so my house is always full, and it was always a gift, and that really, um, I want to stand on the shoulders of all those ancestors, and yeah, as I, two big transformative moments was when I was 13, my dad was killed by a drunk driver, and it just broke me open, and I was at public school, and I just remembered standing there after being out for two weeks, and coming to school and just trying to tell people like we could die at any moment what are we doing and they just sent me to the guidance counselor and just told me I was having psychic episode because my dad had died and so I had this moment that industrial culture suppressed but it's awoken again um, I was also in Ecuador it was great to hear your story Camilo um, during the oil spill that happened in the Aguarico and in the Amazon and I got the honor of living with the Siona Sequoia tribe. And I was 19, and all of a sudden I was seeing a tribe where you were born, you had common land, you had education, you had a home, you had elders. There's no oral history of murder or rape in that small indigenous nomadic community. And I just felt this sense of belonging I had never felt in my life. And that was really when my brain started to be melted down in a beautiful way. And that all stayed with me. It was really hard to return to the United States and um, really in 1999, just because uh, the tension in my body, I just imperfectly did an experiment. I, I 
paid off my college loans and inherited the $150,000 and decided to give it all away and got incredible resistance from my family and just decided to keep my bike and a blanket. And I was terrified and I felt like I'd be annihilated. And on the other end of it, I had my tent and bike and I was okay. Uh, Kazi reminds me of the monks, like you, you find food and you have a place to sleep in the streets. And from there, I was so full of experiencing the gift, whether it was the sun or plants I could eat right from nature. And that led to a lot of experiments. One was a service ride where we dressed up the superheroes named Compassion Man and Love Ninja. Our superpowers were compassion, compassion. And we started just bike around with no plan, all in the gift, no place to stay. Inspired by Peace Pilgrim, it was like karmic yoga um, experiment. And that went on for 20 years until COVID, but we, some rides are up to 60 people. We'd just bike into a town and ask who needed help. It led us to Hurricane Katrina, biking across seven countries. And that was um, amazing, but it was part-time. And so I was starting to get all this energy in my heart. And so that led to, with three other friends who were also part of the superhero rides, to launch a full-time land-based gift economy project called the Possibility Alliance. And it's ongoing, and we've hosted 15,000 visitors all in the gift, and sometimes have as many as 16 people full-time on the land. And it's been, um, yeah, an honor to live this way and welcome people. And one of the most exciting parts is we inc help incubate so many other experiments in the gift, and just so the gift keeps growing. What I'm most excited about is the practical of like how to help ourselves get through challenges and learning and how to make people break through into the gift and how to build the soil. We found a lot of people would leave and go back to the cities and the gift economy would not work for so many. They would get into scarcity and fear and a similar Sadiq to your story of opening up to the gift and then seeing people not honor it. And so we really started to reflect like what's working What's working for us? And we started to realize, first, we had the gift, and part of the gift was receiving, and that was often more difficult for us. Someone would come, like Kazu, your story of someone from prison offering money, and my, my, my patterning would be like if someone came from the indigenous community and offered money, I'd say, no, please keep it. And realizing the gift required receiving, with, without receiving, we are denying interdependence but I love what you said, Kazu. At some point, generosity ends that binary where you're in the room and you don't know who's giving or receiving because it feels so abundant. And we also realized what we call the relational economy. We have seven economies that support the gift. Was that when we embedded with creation, with nature, we catch water and we use wood to heat and we're fossil free on the property and our only bill is a landline. We get one bill a, a month. So by connecting with nature, which is super abundant, one elderberry has grown into hundreds and we've given those hundreds to dozens and dozens of projects, both BIPOC and white communities. So it's just so, so abundant. And the more we connect with creation, the more abundance there is. We also found that also in the relational economy, the more we created community with other humans, we now have a network of people if something happens because we don't have insurance, dozens of people will take our family and the folks living here into their home and we'll do the same for them. So through community, we don't need insurance anymore and all these, all these relational things start to open up, which um, is really exciting. And Camilo, what you said about giving half as a rule, it's, it's exactly what the trees do. Like a tree collects the sun and half of its energy goes into other trees and other microorganisms to keep that flow of the gift going. It keeps enough so that it can drop nuts or apples or seeds in that sharing. And because we had creation with us, we had a backup where if we didn't get enough money for our basic operations, we would just close down until we could open up again and we could just live off the land and living very simple, that was possible. So 
we had a backup system where if we didn't get money, we could continue and then open up again. We never actually had to close down in, in our um, 17 years, which has been really a miracle. And then we also found one important economy was the reduction economy that we had to learn to do without. We had to let go of restaurants and let go of vacations and choosing to instead move that money towards collective liberation, which was much more exciting. So Alonzo de Vosta says one thing they don't teach you in university is how to do with less. So we found a lot of people were trying to do the gift economy, but still wanting a Western style of consumption. And we really found that nature is abundant to what is mutually life-giving. So the gift economy isn't going to support excess. So it was amazing to see like all these economies had to come together. The reduction economy, one thing started to happen, someone would give up a movie and then feel a lack of need of entertainment, storytelling. So we created the fourth economy, which is a replacement economy, but you replace it on your heart's terms. So we don't go out to restaurants, but we go to friends and they come here and we cook surprise meals. So we're becoming more creative. A need for movies, my daughter is always like, oh, my friend saw Little Mermaid or whatever the movie. And we'll say, well, double as many community, local community theaters this year. And they're like, great, we're going to a local community theater. So how do we replace these needs that industrial society is giving us it's such a high cost. And the replacement economy and all these work better in community because we can brainstorm. I miss chocolate in Maine, so let's do strawberry rhubarb pie. Let's create something until we fulfill that need and doing it together. As Audrey Lord says, there's no liberation without community. So we really need each other for the gift economy to work. And then one of the lessons we learned, we started with the reparations paradigm at the Possibility Alliance, that 20% of any gift was given back to black and indigenous and people of color. But we also realized a lot of our courses, mainly people from the white community was coming, and we really realized the gift economy can stay in these bubbles of privilege in the, and they do not flow to where they've been stolen. So we call this the give back economy or rec reparations and if I broke into someone's house and took all these things and then distributed for free it would not be the gift economy so this became a big bedrock that we learned later of like really offering not only transportation but offering stipends for more marginalized groups to make it out to rural Missouri and starting reparations 20% was minimum but then moving to often 100% whenever we have access so Realize without that built in, the cycles of white supremacy and heteropatriarchy can seep into the gift economy. So there's only a couple more, but these are all just exciting learnings that have helped us thrive. And I like what Sierra said about being in present. Um, the gift economy is right here. And so we have the mindfulness and gratitude economy, which is really the more we practice mindfulness and gratitude, we actually start to see the abundance in front of us all the gift economy and disaster capitalism has just corrupted it. It's just, we get all of this from the sun and then it spreads. So how do we practice mindfulness and gratitude? And the newer one we added is purpose and meaning economy, like aligning with the universe's purpose. I always think about any square foot of earth, whether it's water, ocean, or land, is always moving towards a climax ecosystem. It's always moving towards a coral reef and an old growth. And because in those climax systems, there's the most life and there's the most diversity. And so when we align with that, the purpose and meaning, so many other factors come to support us. And people just feel it in their body and they want to support it. So the purpose and meaning economy aligning with the universe's purpose for more life and diversity increases those feedback loops. And we also have, just to honor the transition economy, that the spaces between disaster capitalism and the full gift, barter, trade, sliding scale, are all precious steps towards a full-blown gift economy. And um, I you know, offered everyone here, it's like, what, what can we add? What can we add next to these practices? And the, the beautiful thing is the synergy that happens with these economies. So uh, just give an example of 
something recently happened here by by our reduction in contentment we have excess resources so uh, a wonderful group land in common that's an indigenous and bipoc led land trust had a piece of land next door to us and they're interested in having it in their land trust so because we didn't need much we could fundraise and so the reduction economy led us to the reparations and give back economy and we raised money to turn that into a land trust that then led to more community in relationship with the Wabanaki Autumn Jade Fitch is the project head who's Basmaquati and then Autumn Jade Fitch offered this amazing model of a multiracial land trust that had a gift economy community center so all of a sudden, they were offering us a replacement economy, a way to do land instead of ownership or held by a nonprofit. They've already created this amazing model. And then that, in that model, it's all given as a gift, so we lead back to the gift economy. And then Wabanaki foresters and botanists are creating a land plan, so we're being more interacting into the creation economy. And then all of a sudden, there's incredible purpose, so other people are saying, I have land to give, so now there's three other pieces of land, one's a blueberry barren, one's a coastal property that people want to give to land in common. So the meaning becomes infectious in the most beautiful way. And at this gift economy center, there's meditation and IFS trauma healing every day. So the mindfulness and gratitude economy is kicking in. And so all of these synergize and it just becomes so much more abundant than just thinking in the gift. So those are some of the things that I was excited to share just from our uh, really 25 years of myself being in the gift of some of the learnings as we stopped to say, what what is working? What can we learn from other people? So I, I made a lot of notes from all your ideas too, so they will enhance all that we're learning. So thank you so much. That's some of what I wanted to share. Thank you so much, Ethan. And uh, even though uh, you are on lower energy than usual, the energy that is there and just overflowing uh, really shines through. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you have any writing on the, the liberation economy and all these different economies that you shared that uh, people could access? Um, yeah, one thing is I feel so honored to uh, talk and brainstorm with anybody so feel free to sh share my number I think my number is up there and also both the East Point principles and the liberation economies are in a handbook in a project that Kazu and I just worked on called the fierce vulnerability network around climate change and reparations but in the appendix those principles are written up and I think I don't know Kazu if you could share a link yeah I'll put it in the chat now Excellent. Yeah, and Thank then, you so much. Those are in the appendix. And then the last one is there's um, possibly now someone who lived with us for four months uh, did a series of interviews, and one of them is about the liberation economy. His name is Tucker Walsh, and it's possibly now, but we kind of do a deep dive for an hour and a half after he lived here around some of these ideas. But hopefully those will be helpful. But most exciting to me is um, sharing our our, our wisdom together. So feel free to give a call on the landline. So the the landline is the number that you're calling into now. Yes, this is yeah, this is the number for the possibility alliance. One two oh seven three three eight five seven one nine. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So if anybody wants to call you, they have that. Um, so we only have about uh, 10, 15 minutes for wrapping up and free flow. Uh, I do have a few questions. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Kazu, uh, could you talk a bit about how you relate to gift economy now um, that you've gone through this or you are going through this transition out of NGOs, how that uh, transition has transformed your relation to gift economy and yeah, how things are going for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, the two thoughts come to mind immediately. One is I now live, um, I'm a resident of a community called um, Canticle Farms, which is a community of about 45 people that live in, uh, in kind of intentional community, intentionally multiracial, intergenerational, um, in Oakland. 
And it's a community that's like trying to experiment with the gift economy. And we have people who, you know, live here that or live there or not there now, but um, who have millions of dollars in inherited wealth and families who are just coming up from Central Latin America, seeking asylum, crossing the border with nothing and trying to figure out like how to live in community together. So, you know, like others have said, being in a community of people exploring these things makes so much more possible. Like it is impossible to unplug from capitalism on your own. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why they try to like give you this like delusion of independence, right? Because then you have to rely on the system. And the other thing is, you know, one of the most important things that I've learned about the gift economy is the idea of transparency. But <clears throat> when I work for an organization, um, my, one of my first teachers in the gift economy said to me that like the reason why it will never work in a capitalist system is to just tell people, oh, just like give us what you can. One of the reasons is because we've all been conditioned by the capitalist system to always look for the best bargain. So even unconsciously, if you tell people, oh, just give us what you can, unconsciously, even with the best of intention, we give the least amount possible that makes us not feel guilty about the amount that we're giving. And so it's, it's important for people to be transparent about what your need is. And so when I worked for the organization, the organization would update our finances every quarter, put it up on our website, send it out to our email list saying in the last you know, quarter, we made this much money, we need this much money, whatever. And I think the, the big kind of challenge as I um, step out of nonprofits is, do I have the courage and the vulnerability to share my personal finances with the world? And I share my finances with my partner. We have a kid now. And so we're talking about like, yeah, screw it. Let's do it. Let's talk about like what our financial needs are and tell people like, this is our need. We've exceeded our need for this next few months or we're under this, like we, we, we need this much money. And that gives people information to figure out how they want to relate to me um, on that level. And so, you know, a lot of the principles remain the same, but I think it's like doubling down on community and doubling down on the vulnerability of transparency. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, uh, so you mentioned the eight pillars of the gift economy. Um, do you want to share a little bit more about that? Um, Sure. It emerged out of um, the East Bay Meditation Center. They handed me down what at the time was their six principles of the gift economy. And we added two to it, reworded it. So it's generosity, access, interdependence, sustainability, abundance, equity, transparency, and faith. And um, I don't have it online somewhere, but uh, while someone else talks, why don't I upload it to Google Drive and then I'll share the link in the chat so people can download the, the handout that we have. Hey, you're muted. Think, Sadiq, yeah, you're muted. muted. Oh, sorry. Um, so are there any of the pillars that, uh, you want to share that, uh, you didn't talk about or haven't been mentioned here? I know that the transparency one you just spoke about, the faith one you spoke about with, the the example of the monks, uh, there were one or two that you mentioned that piqued my interest and I was curious about, um, I can't remember exactly which one it was. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I'd love to hear from other folks too, but one of the things um, is uh, about faith. So mm -hmm. much of the gift economy is this like deep, unwavering faith that we will be sustained. And, you know, even when I work for the organization, like if the relationship was there, we would start a program with like zero funding for it. And part of our belief was that if, the universe believes that this is work that needs to be sustained, then the universe will come together to sustain it. And if funding didn't come, like in, in traditional nonprofit work, like if funding doesn't come, that's a challenge that you need to overcome with more fundraising, right? But for us, that was mm -hmm. feedback from the universe saying, hey, this is actually not what's needed right now. And so I think it's about like the humility, like the, 
the calmness to listen to the feedback from the universe and the humility to say, oh, okay, this isn't what the world needs right now. Let me try to find something else. Um, one thing I'll, I'll add is, uh, you know, for the last, before I moved into Canticle Farms, I lived in a one bedroom apartment with no access to like outside land. Now that we have access to land, um, one of the like small changes that I was able to make in my life is I like we air hang our laundry, right? And you know, part of it is like you know, awareness of of our carbon footprint and also like less electricity, even though we have solar panels now. But it gave me an unexpected gift, which is hanging our clothes on the laundry line and feeling the sun, the warmth of the sun behind my back, and knowing that my ancestors have been doing exactly this for hundreds and thousands of years. Like, it's not just a, um, a carbon footprint thing. It's like, it, it reminds me of what it means to be human. And that, like, that groundedness, that, that like, blowing my system down is really important in me being able to hear the feedback from the universe. Like, the earth is constantly giving us feedback about what we should be doing and not doing. But most of the time that feedback is really subtle. And if we're not, like if we're constantly on social media and, and watching movies and doing all these things, like we actually can't hear the feedback from the universe. And that feedback, being able to hear that feedback is a really important part of the gift economy. And so, you know, obviously if you're on the land at the possibility lines with Ethan, like that's all you hear is feedback from the universe. They don't have electricity, you know, really, um, but one of my favorite quotes that I've been repeating recently, ironically, comes from the U.S. Navy SEALs, who says, um, "Slow is smooth, and smooth is fast." And in this like era of incredible urgency, we have so many urgent issues that we do need to address: the climate and all these things. It's really important to learn to slow down because that's what's going to allow us to move through these urgent times with efficiency. Um, so, you know, those are just some random thoughts. But... Thank you. It's beautiful. I think it's actually uh, that slow is smooth uh, phrase is from martial artists, um, generations of martial artists before. Um, Sierra, you had your hand up. You wanted to say something. No. Um, so, well, maybe we can go uh, just a, a quick uh, closing round um, with each of the panelists, if you want to share. Uh, a sentence uh, about what you take away, uh, how you feel, um, any inspiration, any uh, advice, any recommendation, um, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Sierra, would you like to start? I was actually curious if there's any shares, comments from anyone else in the space. I'm happy to share more, but also I'd love to bring in some more voices if anyone has something burning they would like to share. Thank you. Yeah. Look your hand or just jump in there. Hey, um, I have a question actually I'd like to pose. Um, so in conversations with a lot of different people talking about gift economy, something that I hear come up a lot is money karma. And you know this. Um, notion around the intention that goes with money. Um, and I've heard a lot of people say how they feel a bit hesitant receiving sometimes because um, receiving money with other people's malintentions then is passed on to you when you, um, when you receive that and that's in your flow. So I'm just curious, those of you who have experience really trying to open to flows, um, as you all have pointed out, both with giving and receiving, what do you, what is your take on money karma? Um, if you have any experiences with this and um, if there's any kind of lessons surrounding that idea that you could share. Thank you. Um, I had a, I, I had an interlinking thought if I can share. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I think Ethan is asking, maybe it's also connected to something in, um, um, in, you know, in, in Hindu studies or anybody who studies some, any of the Indian scriptures, especially it's called Bhava. 
Bhava uh, is B H A V V uh, V for van A. So Bhava is basically B. I think loosely translated as intention. So wherever the you know I mean we hear this word that wherever energy flows the attention goes or attention goes and energy flows, but the intention I think is the crux of whether anything is. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's whatever we are doing in terms of form, uh, whether it's receiving or giving, I think it's immaterial. But what is the intention? Loosely translated, bhava. Now, bhava basically also means that uh, what I sense is that even I'm trying to practice and be centered in it, is to witness uh, the the structural understanding that what is good for me. Now here me is not small me, it's talking about the larger consciousness, which is M E, which is a capital me. So what is good for me <laughs> will uh, anytime if I am confused about my bhava uh, is that I ask that question. And I think from that question, even if I am not receiving or not giving, I will be very much centered and at peace because I think somehow I have aligned myself with the bhava. And I think it takes a little time. Possibly, maybe we can chew, chew it uh, slowly and gradually and something will come up. Hopefully, it kind of made some sense or it landed to Peyton and everybody else, what I was uh, sharing. Thank you, Darpan. Uh, we had two hands. Um... I think the, who is it, uh, Moo? Well, would you like to unmute? Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, I, this is fantastic. What, isn't this just wonderful? Um, I just want to share, I, I've been, I've been trans, I've been what, what you call transitioning. I've been transitioning somewhat by myself in a, in a big city. So that's, it's, yeah, yeah, it is, it is challenging. Um, and I just want to, I, I love um, recognizing teachers. Don't you just like, you know, you gotta, you gotta, um, you gotta just express that gratitude. Um, and I recently listened to a, a meditation teacher uh, called Beth Upton and she was a student of economics before she became a nun, then she disrobed and she, so she has some talks on, um, gift. She's, she's a real advocate for gift. And I just found when I was listening to one of her talks on YouTube, uh, I was, um, I have been, I kind of had a wake up, a wake up, a bit of a humility moment, um, where I felt like I, sometimes I can be really all in all in to the point at which um, I'm not respecting my own uh, need to survive. Do you understand? I, because I really, really believe in this, but then I don't have that. Um, I can't accept that maybe um, it's not the right time, Do you, like the timeliness or something. And one of the main pieces for me that um, has been, is, is relevant now to me is she, she referred to Jesus and she said, well, Jesus had a trade um, and he was a carpenter and, and that trade was measurable. And it, it, it really exploded things for me because I was just so against, I wanted to be all gift, completely and utterly gift. Um, but she talked about knowing what your gift is and giving that freely. And then it's okay to have a trade if like you cannot even to support, if you cannot give that gift freely at this time, and maybe it's your whole life that you can't, you know, like all those, like she talked about some artists and I was like, oh yeah. Um, you know, maybe that it's not recognized, but knowing, yeah. So th that's just stayed with me um, as, as something. So I wanted to throw that in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mo. That was a beautiful sharing and a beautiful note to end on. Um, the next session is starting in just a couple of minutes, so we do need to wrap up. Um, unless you have a very quick thing uh, that you wanted to share, uh, Sound World. Uh, 
you can say it in one minute or less. So gift seems like a confusion, Confucius, Taoism and Buddhism, all three came together in China. And what has been shared right now is cumulatively together they made civilizations. Great ones at that. And there I would say that the first narrator that I heard, I came in late, sounded like do nothing, say nothing about the funding and not getting funding. And this last one that was given about gift in a way that you give your trade is coming from a different ontology altogether. It's coming from Christian theology. So we are bringing our narratives into gift. But what is, so yeah, we're bringing our philosophies into it. Are we really doing something new or are we just finding a new way of doing the old? Very deep questions, which I'm sure each of us um, will need to take away and, and keep asking and living into. Thank you. And thank you, uh, all of the, the participants. Thank you for listening. Thank you for contributing, for sharing. Uh, it's been really wonderful. And I'm sure that we will have a lot uh, to chew on and to work with. Um, you have uh, the links for um, the work and the different things that people have shared in the chat. So please, if you want to follow those, click on them now before you uh, leave the room. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody.